Welcome to another episode of Conversations. Today we have Elizabeth Yarnell. Did I say that right? Yarnell? You did. Okay. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here today. Well, thank you, Don. I'm so excited for our Donversation. <laughs> so we were talking before we hit record that I have just gone down a rabbit hole as far as learning about inflammation and anti-inflammatory, the diet, toxins. Okay. And I know you like to talk about parasites. So my question, I put a star by it. How do we know if we have parasites? How do we know? Yeah. So it's, it's tricky because parasite testing is notorious for false negatives, which means that you could deliver a stool sample to your doctor's office and the laboratory could look it over and it could come back negative and you could feel like, oh, well, that's cleared. I don't have parasites. But the thing is, is that it's a 50, 50 shot. Like if you get a positive finding of parasites, then great. You know, hundred percent, you got them, but a negative finding 50, 50 chance, you probably do have them. If you think you have them, I like to say your body, your brain is probably your subconscious probably knows you have them. And if you suspect you have them, you probably have them. And I always think it's better just to treat for parasites, whether or not you have a positive test result, because no harm done either you'll get the parasites or nothing. Cause if you use herbal um, remedies, the way that I promote, mm -hmm. um, then it doesn't ruin your microbiome the way that pharmaceuticals do mm -hmm. doesn't hurt anything else just addresses the parasites. And if you have parasites and you don't address them, they're never going to go away. And your body will continue to be in this cycle of constant inflammation because our immune system its job is to look for foreign invaders and mm -hmm. then to start the inflammatory process to get rid of them, the immune process, the immune cascade, we call it. And, um, and usually if those invaders are bacteria or viruses, it works pretty well because we create antibodies against bacteria. We create fever against viruses and inflammation kind of accompanies all of that. But if it's a parasite, they don't care about inflammation. They don't care about antibodies. None of that fever doesn't matter to them at all. And so you will still have this um, continual cycle really of, of your body ramping up and becoming inflamed and you getting symptoms because the parasites are still there and your body will see it and they'll know it's there. And the job of a parasite is to find a host and take up residence and then reproduce forevermore. Bleh. <laughs> what okay how how do what are the symptoms how do you even know so symptoms from parasites could be almost anything they could be gi symptoms you could have um diarrhea you could have constipation you could have just digestive distress when you eat you could have a uh, vomiting you could have headaches you could have sleep disturbances and insomnia if you wake at like between two and three in the morning often that's a, often a sign that parasites are active. That's they're lunar creatures. And so they're often active in the middle of the night. Um, you might even have a whole lunar cycle cycle where around the full moon, you might notice that your symptoms get worse. You might have joint achiness. You might have vision disturbances. Um, I actually have a parasite quiz that you can take and it's at parasitesinside.com. And if you go there and you can take the quiz and it'll give you um, 30 or so symptoms that might indicate that you have parasites and save yourself the cost and the time of testing. The other problem is like if you go to a GI doc or any doc and you say, I want to test for parasites, the only thing they're going to offer you is a stool test. And there are so many reasons why that stool test might not show up positive for parasites. Parasites, one being that some parasites are anaerobic and they'll have disintegrated by the time that stool sample arrives at the lab. Another being that maybe they're, they're just not in that particular stool sample. Mm -hmm. um, and then another one being that many, many parasites don't live in our gut. They, they're not going to come out in our stool. Parasites can live in your blood like Chagas. They can live in your heart like trichinosis. Like they, they can live in your brain like T. Gandhi. They can live in your muscles. They can live in anywhere. They don't have to be in your GI system and they might not be coming out in your stool. That's frightening. Where are we getting them from food? You can, you can get them from food for sure. Especially uncooked food, including like sushi, which mm. is sad, yeah. um, <laughs> but raw, raw or undercooked pork. We've known for 
many centuries that that can cause sickness because that's trichinosis. But you can also get them from swimming in a lake or river on a hot summer's day, you can kind of recall that. But even from swimming in a public pool or a water park, because chlorination doesn't always kill the parasites and a lot of them are waterborne. So you can get them from working in your garden, from walking barefoot. They can come up, the strong elites will come up through the soles of your feet. Um, you can get them from um, petting your dog, <laughs> letting them lick you. You can get them from changing your kitty litter. Wow. Tidon becomes through the, it, it becomes airborne when you change kitty litter. Um, it's just so easy to get parasites from a mosquito bite or a tick bite, right? Oh, like wow. Lyme disease. Right. I knew about Lyme disease. So if you leave things untreated, is it just that you feel like crap all the time? And I mean, or well, so you'll often start off in an acute phase at the beginning because your body will kind of go into hyperdrive. And that's when you might have a lot of diarrhea. You might have been traveling or you might have, you might remember a time when you're like, wow, I thought I had food poisoning or a 24 hour stomach bug. And you were just kind of really sick for maybe anywhere from a day to two weeks. And then you kind of eased out of that and maybe weren't quite a hundred percent after that, mm -hmm. but you didn't, after a time being, you don't even remember what a hundred percent used to be. And this becomes your new normal, this kind of lower level of vitality. And you don't remember it until after you actually get rid of the parasites. And then all of a sudden you're like, wow, I have so much energy. I can't remember ever having this much energy because it's been so long. So that's the chronic phase that you can enter into, which is survivable because the goal of a parasite is not to kill the host. And the human body is wired for survival. So it doesn't want to die either, mm -hmm. but it might just be that. So for instance, often for me, one of my common symptoms is diarrhea, but mm -hmm. I'll only have diarrhea once a day. So in the morning I might have diarrhea, but then the rest of the day I'm fine. And so I can live like that, right? And I lived like that for 10 years with parasites at one point in my life. So that might be it. Or it might be that you have a low level headache a lot of the time. And you're like, well, but I can push through it. I can live like that. But it, you have a lower level of vitality because of that. But it's not as debilitating as maybe that acute phase, like when you thought you had food poisoning, when you were having diarrhea, like every half an hour mm. or vomiting and feeling terrible and you really couldn't move out of bed and all that kind of stuff. So how do you test if, if a stool sample isn't always reliable, do you do a blood test or how do you test? I don't recommend testing. I oh. just treat by symptoms. Oh. Okay. You think automatic, cause a lot of the symptoms sound like things that like joint pain that also I noticed was on your symptoms list of inflammation because inflammation doesn't always equal a parasite, right? Not always, but I often, I think more often than not, there's a parasitic infection at the root of chronic inflam inflammation and inflammatory issues. How do you prevent yourself, you, from getting, getting sick all the time? What do you do? There's almost no way to prevent, but I regularly treat. So like about once a year, I do an intestinal cleanse and then I follow it with a parasite protocol for a month of herbs um, that are parasiticidal because an intestinal cleanse doesn't kill any parasites. It just might remove some of them that are happen to be in your digestive system. Um, but it does open things up in your intestines to uh, make the parasites more, the parasite herbs more effective at reaching and killing off the parasites. Okay. What, can you give an example of an herb that's really good? Well, just one herb won't do it because yeah, okay. each herb does different things. So, um, you need a combination of herbs and you need the right combination and you need the right amount, which is okay. why it's really important to, to have professional guidance and mm -hmm. not just want to run and go pick up some wormwood somewhere. Right. Right. Yeah. Because, because that's what we do. <laughs> right. We meaning right. me, I Google and then it's like, okay, Amazon order. <laughs> right. Oh, I think I need some cloves. Cloves are great for killing off the eggs of parasites. And in fact, in India, um, babies are often given clove tea in their bottles to help keep them clear of parasites. Um, but that'll only kill off the eggs. And um, pharmaceutical drugs, not antibiotics. Antibiotics don't kill parasites. Don't don't let anybody give you a Z-pack for parasites. Okay. Um, but 
the parasitic, um, parasiticidal antibiotics are not antibiotics, parasiticidal drugs are like flagell and ivermectin. You might've heard of that recently. Mm -mm. Um, but that they, both of them don't discriminate between parasites and good bacteria and good bugs. And we have more good bacteria in our microbiome than the rest of all the other cells in our whole body. And if you take a parasiticidal pharmaceutical drug, a medicine like flagell, it wipes out everything and you end up this empty shell. You need those probiotics, those good bugs to survive and to fully digest your food. So you have to really start from scratch to build up your microbiome and it doesn't kill off the eggs. Some parasites lay 10,000 eggs a day. Oh my God. That makes me want to throw up. <laughs> it does. It's really <laughs> gross. But let me tell you, when you do a parasite cleanse and you see those buggers coming out and you're like, okay, I'm really glad I'm doing this. <laughs> God. Okay. So I saw you um, did a Ted talk and I watched almost all of it. Um, I, and I only stopped because I, we were going to do the podcast. Um, but anyway, <laughs> it was very interesting and it was 10 years ago. So you found out you had MS, you woke up and you could not see out of one of your eyes. Do you currently mm -hmm. have MS? MS is incurable. I will okay. always have it. And so that's what took you down this road of finding out about, was it inflammation? Well, you do, you, they probably don't know the cause if it's not curable. Well, so medical doctors will say, um, MS and other autoimmune conditions are idiopathic, which means we don't know why they happen and we don't know how to stop them because we're not really sure what's going on. And in fact, kind of as a cop up, they'll say, we think the immune system is attacking itself. You are allergic to yourself. And that's why you have these random, this random inflammation that's debilitating to you. Like in multiple sclerosis, you may be familiar what kinds of symptoms, but it could be anything from balance and gait issues to weakness in your hands and your legs. Um, you might even lose the use of some of your extremities and be in a wheelchair. And um, in fact, the downhill slope course in medicine for MS is just like a gradual loss of all your abilities until you get to the bottom and you die. Um, but it's so grim it is. And so when I was diagnosed at the age of 29, just two weeks before my 30th birthday, I was told that within 10 years I would be in a wheelchair. And I was like, well, I don't want to do that. <laughs> right. That's not, the, that's not the plan I had for my life. What can I do to make this better for me? And they said nothing, the doctors. And I said, well, I can't just sit back and let this happen to me. That's not my personality. And that's when I started looking into first into food and how what we eat affects how we feel and function. And, and apparent, that's a tremendous knowledge base to have because we don't learn it growing up in our school system. Doctors don't learn it in medical school. At the most, doctors take maybe a half an hour course <laughs> on nutrition, like right. almost nothing. Um, and and so that's where I started. And that's when I did my TED talk after I had published my cookbook and um, really uh, actually gotten a patent on a unique cooking method on how to prepare whole foods. What I was really focused on at that time was all of the toxins in our contaminated food supply. Um, if you look at your labels on anything you buy that's food-based, there'll be a hundred things on there. Yeah. Um, most of which are not recognizable as foods. They might be chemical names. And a lot of which are synthetic and they're artificially created. So artificial flavors, artificial colors, artificial fragrances, anything actually that even says fragrance. And it's not going to use that word artificial. In fact, even if natural they say natural flavors, <laughs> flavors that's, it that's says that in everything. Rule. You see natural oh, flavors in horrendous. everything. Yeah. Oh, it's so awful. And they're like, I have on my blog, I have a list of the chemicals that are in the natural flavors in a strawberry McDonald's milkshake, which was a coup to get that one because they're considered proprietary secrets and it's a chemical stew and they don't have to tell you what it is. They just have to say, oh, this is a natural flavor. And there's also another one they use like spices. If it just says spices. That's also a chemical stew. If it's a spice, if if there are spices in there, they're going to say oregano, rosemary, whatever the spices are. If it's just this kind of 
generic spices, that mm -hmm. means it's chemicals. Just like if it's just this generic natural flavors, that means it's chemicals. If it's really natural flavors, they're going to say essential oil of lemon or lemon rind or lemon juice or just lemon. Yeah, it's but so it's scary that they're just doctoring real. with everything. And we're already in a battle with having the soil really depleted from all the nutrients and everything and minerals that we need. So, you know, if you're trying to do your best by eating that and then you pour a salad dressing on it, that's totally, <laughs> it's like, it's so It is very hard to find a clean salad dressing, I have to say. Right. Very hard to find a clean one. Right. So, okay. To, towards in, inflammation. Yes. What is a good way to start if you feel like you're dealing with the symptoms of inflammation, which would be like pain in your joints, um, chronic headaches? Well, you just took my inflammation quiz and I think there are 76 questions on that. So there are 76 symptoms that could be, that indicate inflammation in your body. Okay. Basically, I just like to say, Inflammation is anything negative or wrong going on in your body. If your body is functioning perfectly and you don't have any inflammation, you feel great. You function perfectly. You have nothing wrong with you. And when I say nothing, I mean, you don't have a runny nose. You don't sneeze a lot. You don't clear your throat. Mm -hmm. You don't have a little headache. Sometimes you don't have brain fog. You don't, um, have insomnia, you sleep really well, you don't have any joint issues or pain issues in your body, you you don't have a tremor or a tremble, you know, mm -hmm. you you run fast, everything. Yeah. I know that some of the ones that I answered, I said occasionally or whatever, just because like seasonal allergies, I mean, that's something you can't really get away from if it's, if you're allergic to ragweed or, I mean, that's so in, right. In medical speak, that's called rhinitis, right? Because the rhino is your nose and itis is medical terminology for inflammation. So that's inflammation in your nose. You can deal with seasonal allergies. In fact, I have a homeopathic seasonal allergy remedy on my website at elizabethyarnell.com in the shop. That is amazing. And um, within a year or two or a couple seasons of taking it, like I look at me, I'm sitting out here right now. I no longer have seasonal allergies. And you used to. Oh, they were terrible. Wow. Is it true? Tell me if this is a myth. Is it true that you slowly introduce what it is that you're allergic to so that your body gets used to it? Is that a thing? Well, that is. So that is a theory that, okay. that allergists have and that they use, like they do that often, um, with peanuts and things like that. That's not something I work with. Um, what I'm more talking about is homeopathy, which is somewhat similar in that the founding basis of homeopathy is that like here's like, um, but you would never know it because like, I'm not going to like put a bunch of flowers in your nose or anything like that. <laughs> and it's literally just a little tincture bottle that you just put underneath your tongue and, um, it's like magic. Either it works or it doesn't. And there are no side effects. And if it doesn't oh. work, it doesn't work. It's just like water. Well, that's nice. And a tincture yeah. is the quickest way to get things into your system, isn't it? Yes. And this goes, it's not actually a tincture. That's a different okay. technique. Um, it's, uh, it's homeopathy. So it's a solution and it goes underneath your tongue, which is the uh, very thin skin so very close to get to your circulatory system so it gets okay. into your system well okay and you mentioned food sensitivities what is the difference between a sensitivity and being like allergic or you can't have the substance at all like what is the difference so if you're allergic to say we'll go back to peanuts um you probably know that already you've probably figured that out because right. you probably had a near-death experience, basically, where you've gone into anaphylactic shock from exposure to peanuts, either eating it or the peanut dust or something, being around it. Um, so that's a true allergy. But there are four types of hypersensitivity reactions, and only type one is an anaphylactic reaction. So if you have um, a reaction to type three, type two, type two, three, type four hypersensitivity reactions, 
that can just manifest as inflammation in your body. So it could be, um, it could be gut disorder. You could become constipated. I know like my son, when he eats broccoli of all things, he gets constipated, but it's not that day. And it's not the next day. It's the day after that. So oh, food funny. sensitivities can manifest up to four days after you've ingested them. So it can be kind of tricky to pinpoint them down. Some things might happen quickly. Like I know um, there are some things that if I eat, I'm literally half an hour, I am on the toilet. But that one's easier to figure out yeah. than, um, than other ones. For instance, uh, a couple summers ago, I realized that every afternoon I was getting this kind of like around 2 p.m., I was getting this little headache kind of like right here behind my eyebrow and I didn't know what it was and I didn't, wasn't sure what it was. And then I went away for a week. And so my diet changed because I wasn't at home and I hadn't even noticed that I didn't have the headaches, but when I came back, the headache started again. And I'm like, well, what is going on? And I realized that I had been putting vanilla almond milk in my coffee and it's the vanilla flavoring that's not real, the synthetic vanilla flavoring that was that I was having a food sensitivity reaction to eight hours, six hours after drinking it, after mm. being exposed to it, that was causing that little headache. So I took that out and switched to plain almond milk that had nothing added to it and no longer got the headaches. Oh, that's so interesting. I think elimination diets are just fascinating when you, so, when you slowly take things out and then if you introduce them back in and you start seeing effects, then it's like, okay, that's definitely so a trigger. That term is tough because a classic elimination diet is where you literally go down to eating chicken, rice, and pears for two weeks, Oh, which is wow. miserable. And then you start adding things in and I have a lot of clients that are sensitive to chicken or rice or pears. In fact, I'm even sensitive to rice myself. So I don't like that term. What I like to use is what's called a restricted diet. So I use a very, very sensitive food sensitivity test, which is the gold standard of food sensitivity testing called the MRT. It is not Everly Well or the ones that you might mm -hmm. be hearing advertised on the radio or TV. Those are looking for antibody creations, which are not super helpful when we're talking about food sensitivities. If you might remember during the pandemic and we were searching for um, a vaccine against, mm -hmm. the, against COVID and we were, the goal was to find something that would create those anti-COVID antibodies in our body so that the next time we were exposed to COVID, we would be protected. Mm -hmm. And so if we're doing a food sensitivity test and we're looking for existence of antibodies and I turn up like I have antibodies to mangoes, well, shouldn't that mean that I can eat mangoes and I'm protected? Right, right. But that's not what it means. And that's not how they're being used, which is why they're not helpful. Um, so instead, the MRT uses mediators like histamine, cytokines, chemokines, prostaglandin. These are chemicals that are released by our blood cells, our white blood cells upon exposure to anything they deem to be a threat. Mm -hmm. And so this particular food sensitivity test looks at over 170 foods and chemicals that are very common to figure out which ones cause this person to become inflamed that trigger the inflammation that, tr that causes the symptoms that they're having. So like for my son, he was very sensitive to broccoli, lemon, and garlic, three things we think are super healthy for anybody. Yeah, right. But for him, they were kind of deadly and they were keeping him in constant pain. And for me, one of my most inflammatory foods is lettuce. You're Who would kidding. suspect lettuce? Right? Oh my gosh. I mean, what do you reach for when you want to be healthier? You reach for salad. And for me, that was keeping me in an inflamed state. And now once I learn that and I remove that from my diet, I can see that when I eat lettuce, I become wobbly on my feet. I get MS symptoms and I oh, wow. trip over and fall down, which I have done after eating lettuce before. Did your vision come back? I got about 
percent of the vision back in that eye. But my eye doctor loves to tell me every time I go in, you don't see the way everybody else does. <laughs> oh, really? Well, that's yeah, interesting. Yeah, it's not very nice of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's like, but, okay, thanks for stating the obvious. But so with, uh, with two eyes, that's how you get depth perception, mm -hmm. both of your eyes working together. So it took a little while for me to get accustomed to a new depth perception, but now I am. Um, now I don't even really notice unless I look for it. Well, that's good. Did you slow down the symptoms of MS by going down this health path? I basically not only slowed down, but stopped them and reversed any that I had had. Yeah. Um, like I can't reverse the 7% of vision that I lost because that's a scar tissue. And right. once there's a scar tissue, that's pretty much there. So the, the goal is to do it before you get those scar tissues. Mm -hmm. Right. And to even, so what I teach in my inflammation Academy is how to recognize when you are at the beginning of a food sensitivity or hypersensitivity reaction and the inflammation is starting and how do you nip it in the bud? Let's nip it in the bud before it progresses to the point where it could cause scarring and then long-term damage. Right. Um, one thing, and then we'll go to the results of my test, but I mean, were you, was Google a thing? 10 years, 15 years ago, or how did you find your information out? How, what was your research? So much research. Um, but I actually went and I went back to school. I got a doctorate in naturopathy or natural health. And okay. um, so that's where a lot of my learning came from was through my coursework and my lessons. And then I, I have, I don't know, 17 to 20 additional certifications of, of courses that I've taken as well. Oh my gosh. I bet people ask you questions all the time, <laughs> <laughs> which is great because that's why I'm here. Really. Right. That's my goal in life is I want everyone to understand that your health is within your own hands. You don't have to be host held hostage to whatever diagnosis or condition they say you have, you can right. change it. It's within your own power, but only you can do it. There's no magic pill that's going to save you. Nothing else can do it. You have to be the one who wants to make the changes because as I said in my TED talk, we live in a toxic world and mm -hmm. no one is looking out for our health. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that gives people hope though. You know, you're in, you're in the driver's seat, so it's time to take exactly. charge. And yeah, no, I like that. Um, okay. So I took the test. And some of the questions I like hesitated to answer if it was often because I never, I didn't feel like it was always often, but I still answered them. So I got a 50. Is that really bad? <laughs> like There's brain no fog? Bad or good, yes. Right? Brain so fog, headaches. Yes. I deal yeah. with those. Well, so what it does is it indicates that there's inflammation in your body that you should address because really it'll only get worse. Okay. The downhill slope. It's not going to get better. It's not going to go away by yourself by itself unless you make some changes. And um, that's why I have the Inflammation Academy is to help people understand and learn what those changes are that they can start making. Because it might be as simple as you need to change your laundry detergent. Oh my gosh. Wow. That would be nice if that's all it was. <laughs> well, that could be a big one because if you think about it, like I remember a couple years ago, I was driving the carpool to preschool and we picked up my neighbor's kid and he got in the car and his clothes were so saturated with Tide. The aroma filled the whole car. I had to roll down my window. My eyes were tearing. And I'm thinking this poor child is enveloped in this bubble of artificial fragrance, mm -hmm. toxic, because even though fragrance, we can't see it, they're still molecules. And those are chemical molecules that are being absorbed into your lungs and adding to your whole toxic load, your toxic burden in your body, which leads towards autoimmunity in the end. So there's a lot of things that you can do. And some of them might be that simple. 
Yeah. And, but that is also difficult because like my mom, she had a rash on her leg and they were trying different creams and stuff. And then they ended up saying, switch your detergent to a non-fragrance. And she said, my clothes, they just smell like nothing. They smell. And cause we want that fresh, fresh smell, which I know it's toxic. <laughs> we want that because it. the marketers have told us we need it, Yeah, but we don't actually right. need it. And once you pull that stuff away, you actually reclaim your nose. And then you start to smell things that you haven't really noticed that you could smell before, like flowers and um, other scents, because those chemicals deaden our smell receptors in our nose. We become so, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Desensitized. Yeah, because they're just always there and they cover up all these other scents in our world. One of the things I like to do is promote cooking by smell. Like you should know when your food is done by what it smells like. And in my cookbook, that's the cue I give. How do you know when it's done? Well, because the aroma will come out of the oven and it'll come find you in your house. Um, Yeah. So I wanted to talk about your cookbook too. You can save your nose by getting rid of a lot of those chemical fragrances that they tell us we need, but we don't need. Yeah, that's super interesting. So yeah, let's talk about your cookbook. Okay. Um, I thought I wrote it down. I know it said uh, gourmet something in it. It's well, glorious one pot meals. Oh, <laughs> it didn't even have gourmet in it. Sorry. That's um, okay. okay. It had yeah. glorious. <laughs> what, and what made you glorious start Glorious like hallelujah, by the way, not Gloria. It's glorious. <laughs> <laughs> what made me do that? Because after I was diagnosed, Um, and I started my first, my first deep dive into research was into how food affects our health. Mm -hmm. And I realized that I didn't know how to cook and I was eating like crap. And also I had MS, so fatigue was a big issue. And I, I started started taking cooking classes and watching the food network, which was then in its infancy Mm -hmm. and, um, playing around, but I would end up with this kitchen full of dirty dishes that would like an hour of cleanup or whatever and it would take like two hours to make a meal every day and I just didn't have time for that I'm not right. an entrepreneur I'm busy so um uh so that's when I realized I needed to find a better solution and um honestly I call myself an accidental inventor because I had received a cast iron Dutch oven like a Le Creuset as a mm-hmm. wedding gift And I wasn't sure what to do with it, but then I was inspired by seeing an infomercial and I went to my oven and I put it at 450 degrees, which is super hot. And I just like went around to my fridge and freezer and put in anything I had, which was some frozen fish fillets and some fresh vegetables and some herbs and put the lid on it and put it in this 450 degree oven, which if you know anything about cooking, you're like, oh my God, you put fish in 400 degrees. That's, um, you would never do that, but I didn't know. And um, within half an hour, it just started to smell like dinner. And then I realized, you know what? It works with everything. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And I love the ease of that, but it's a good way to get all those veggies. Yeah. What is your stance on um, oils? Do you think that seed oils are bad as far as like olive oil or avocado oil? So olive oil and avocado oil are not seed oils. Um, avocado those are fruit oils right avocado olives are fruits avocados are fruits oh okay um, Learned something seed new. oils <laughs> seed oils are more like grapefruit um grape seed oil is a seed oil uh, sesame seed oil is a seed oil uh sunflower seed oil is a seed oil mm-hmm. um and i know they get a bad rap but i the way the amount that i use in my glorious one pot meals which is literally just to coat the inside of the mm-hmm. pot um, is so little that I don't think that's a big issue. Um, I think some of the angst about them is a little overblown. Um, it's really extreme. Like people are either like, I use oil all the time. What's the big deal? And other people are like, Oh, (laughs) war against the seed oils. And that's why I was asking you, because I mean, I know it's just your opinion, but still, I just am curious because I, I didn't a realize that a seed oil was not avocado or olive oil so that I cook with those all the time. Um, but yeah, like those are very safe. 
Yeah. Everybody's got their stance. And sometimes they say it depends on what, how high you heat it. You shouldn't heat it past a certain point. That's what makes things dangerous. So like deep frying, you don't want to deep fry in a seed oil. Um, But often people use like toasted sesame oil, which is the seed oil as a cold pressed as like in a salad dressing or something. Mm -hmm. So that's not even cooked. Right. And that's okay. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, I think that all the, some of that depends on how much you use it. Right. Right. Oh yeah. You don't want to overuse anything. Yeah. I think anything is bad and extremes like that. Um, what else were we going to talk about? I think we covered it. Food sensitivity, inflammation, <laughs> MS, and parasites. So tell them um, your website where they can go and take your inflammation quiz and the parasite quiz, which I'm going to go take right after we're done here. <laughs> so the inflammation quiz is at um, inflammationinvestigator.com and give yourself some time. It usually takes between 10 and 15 minutes. So it's not a fast quiz. Right. Um, but it'll give you a lot of information. You'll learn a lot of things. You'll be like, wow, I didn't realize that was a symptom of inflammation. Mm-hmm. Am I right? Yeah, a hundred percent. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so that one's totally worth it. And then the parasite quiz, which um, will soon lead into my parasite masterclass, which is coming soon. But that one is at parasitesinside.com. And um, as I said, I think that oftentimes hidden parasitic infections is at the root of so many symptoms of chronic inflammation that it's worth clearing out the parasites. And again, that's something that no doctor will ever tell you, but um, doctors don't understand the frequency, how common parasites are either. We might think, oh, they're common in places like India. Um, And here in the U.S., we have very good hygiene and and water sanitation, which is true, but that mm-hmm. doesn't mean we don't have parasites. We have them all over the place. And even in municipal water supplies, there was one point in the 1980s or 90s when the entire city of Milwaukee was infected with cryptosporidium through their municipal water supply. Um, I don't know if you remember in 2018 when um, a lot of people were getting, I think it was cyclospora. Mm-hmm. And they tracked it back to salads from McDonald's in like right. 13 Midwestern states. Yeah. So it's just really easy to pick up parasites. And probably if you think you have them, you probably do because parasites have a consciousness and they affect how you think. Oh my gosh. Well, and I think we get the words intertwined, normal and common, you know, we say, oh, that's normal to have brain fog when you're older you know, whatever, or, or that's, that's normal, normal to be constipated. Right. right? And it's, it's not normal to only poop once or twice a week. It is not right. Right. It's, it's something that's common, but that doesn't make it normal. So right. thank you so much for being on the podcast. I'll put all your information in the show notes, but you answered so many questions. It's kind of overwhelming and scary and and <laughs> overwhelming and scary, <laughs> but it's good to know. I mean, the more, you know, the more you can do about it. So I think it's, great that you, you make this information out there for people. It's wonderful. If you're unaware, then you can't do anything. Right. All you can do is suffer and wait and hope somebody helps you. But you know what? That's what I'm here for. So I hope that if people feel overwhelmed after listening to this podcast, which I don't want them to, I just want them to be aware. Um, and I want them to know there's hope. And they should just reach out to me. You can go on the footer in any page on my website at elizabethyarnell.com and um, schedule a free naturopathic consultation with me. And I'll be happy to chat with you and we can look and see what's going on in your body. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time to be on my podcast. I really appreciate it. And maybe you can come back again and we can talk about it some more. (laughs) I would love to come back, Don. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Thank you. We'll talk soon. Okay. All right. Bye-bye.